team, the Tuaweza Fraternity that have organized this event uh, around. So very briefly, I want to say a little about Tuaweza. Who are we? We are a regional non-government organization. We are headquartered in Dar es Salaam, and our work is through research, evidence, and action. We do work in Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. Our, me, our vision is we believe in an open society where built on human impulse to make a difference, where information flows, um, ideas are shared, are shared, citizens are engaging, and authorities are accountable to the people. And also to say that our work is delivered under three mission statements that are interrelated. The first being demonstrating citizen agency. The second being amplifying citizens' voice. And the third, working on the conditions that state agency and voice from the perspective uh, focusing on access to information. So in terms of concrete, concretely what we do, on access to information, we work with the Africa Freedom of Information Center and the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance. And our interest there is to explore how we can promote the culture of proactive disclosure of information within government and we are running some pilots in Kamuli, in Kole, in Moyo, and Namutumba, and soon we'll add Rwanda District and Chenjojo. And what we do, we do trainings, take the public officials there through the ATI guides and the act, but also do support visits, the mentoring with the support of AFIC, and try to follow up to see how much information is being proactively disclosed. Um, also, in terms of the work that we do under animation, where we do community action research, the pilot again is running in Kamuli, Kole, Namutumba, and we are rolling out in Chenjojo and Rwanda. And essentially is to inspire collective community action, but also facilitate dialogue between the leaders and the community ultimately with the hope that we are able to improve um, local governance, but also improve the quality of service delivery at that micro level. And the, 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 the essence is really you notice that what we are doing in access to information is happening at the same time where we are doing the animation work. But also we try to connect these two pieces of work with what we do at the national level. And that is the issues that come through the subnational work in those local governments, we try to integrate them into our national platform, the Saudi Zawanayinchi, by way of uh, designing tools or data collection tools that reflect on the field-based issues so that we give this data a national character. And therefore, we can present it to the sectors and have the policymakers interface with it. But also, we do work with some of members of parliament. I do recognize Honorable Kiveri is in the room. You're most welcome. And other colleagues, the essence is to make sure that the citizens' voices find their way into those policy-making spaces. But also, we work a lot with the media. We have worked with the media for as long as Tuaweza has existed because we believe we need to have conversations that are shaped by data. So on that note, I want to say that our third strand of work is the Saudi Zawanainchi, which is a nationally representative high-frequency mobile phone survey um, and has been reviewed and approved by an independent research uh, review board, but also it's been validated by the World Bank. We've been implementing Saudi since 2013 in Tanzania and in Uganda, 
we only started in 2017, and since then we've done about 20 call rounds on a range uh, of different topics in terms of social service delivery uh, and governance that are affecting Ugandans. Right now, we are running a panel of 3,000 uh, respondents, as Marie will highlight more, and it's the reason we are here today. So, and what we are going to be doing this morning, we would like to share the Ugandan citizens' experiences and opinions on the business, taxation, and the economy, so that we can have public debate and explore means for Ugandans' voices to be taken into policy and practice. So to us, we think having just gotten out of COVID-19, but then also looking at the many factors at the global level that are affecting uh, businesses and the business environment world over, we feel that probably it's time we try to get to the back end of how citizens feel about this. And probably during the course of our conversation, we should be able to propose or to come up with recommendations that we feel if implemented by the policy makers, they can make a dent or they can contribute towards addressing some of the data or the insights that have been raised or the gaps that have been raised by the data. And of course, when I was reflecting on, or on this process, one of the things that came to me was the fact that um, uh, for Tuaweza, really uh, data means a lot. And everything that we do, our engagements, our work is built on data because we believe without data, you can only do so much. But when we have data, we are able to make better decisions. And on that note, I would like to hope that through this interaction and engagement, we should be able to engage with the data and interact with it at depth and interrogate it to probably be able to make recommendations and proposals to contribute to the well-being or to the improvement and the development of our country. I would like to wish you us, to wish you all a good stay and hope that we'll have a productive conversation. I would like to thank you. As I get off the mic, I would like to recognize um, the commissioner from the OPM. Mr. Ruanga, you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Violet. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to invite Mary. Yes, uh, I'd like to introduce Marina Nyanzi, the senior program officer at Traweza, and uh, I'm inviting her to do uh, for us two things. Marie has um, a short video about Saudi Zona Inchi. You're not doing that? All right, but uh, you'll be able to talk through it, uh, through the information about Saudi Zona Inchi. And then she also present the citizens' views and experience of business and tax environment in Uganda, which has been dubbed as money, money, money. Uh, but before she does that, uh, after this presentation, we will have a panel which will be digesting or help us to uh, read more into the data that will be presented. And I'm glad to mention that our panelists are already here. Uh, allow me to identify them as uh, um, Mr. Isaac Arimitwe, where are you, Isaac? Kind of raise your hand. Yeah, you're welcome. He's from the tax policy department. And then we have Mr. Masembe Michael. He's the manager tax education at URA. And then we have Robert Suna, who is the tax justice research expert at, uh, uh, yes, you're welcome, uh, Suna. 
And then uh, we have Francis Kabuye. Where are you? Yes, um, he's from the Federation of Small and Medium uh, Sized Enterprises. I will be looking forward to receiving the Honorable Henry Kibaria uh, whenever he arrives. He's here? Oh, my Honorable, you are welcome. We are glad to have you once again. You have always been part of our weather, so we are hopeful that um, we'll benefit more from you today. Marie, go ahead. on technology yeah so um, my name has already been mentioned so I want to once again thank you all for coming and honoring um, this invitation I'll, I'll start by sharing briefly on uh, the methodology before I go into the findings but uh, this brief is titled money money, money, and we'll be sharing the citizens' views and experiences on business and the tax environment in Uganda. The data that we are sharing today is from a panel that was set up in 2021, that is uh, in October. This panel has 3,000 respondents covering the entire country across different locations. And we have, from the moment of the baseline, setting up the baseline, we have conducted two core rounds. One was on business and youth. Then uh, we also had one on taxation. So we have combined data from both rounds. And also we will be comparing with some data that was collected in 2019. Violet already mentioned that our methodology has been approved, or the research protocol has been approved by the Uganda National Council of Science and Technology. And we, before that approval was uh, gained, we worked closely with UBOS, and here their role was to really assist us in the sampling of the different locations, and also work on the, on the methodology. So they gave us a sampling frame, which we utilized to ensure that we randomly select locations across the entire country. Then at the local level, getting into the EA, as you know, in Uganda, you really need to seek permission. We worked with the local authorities to get to the different villages across the country. So here I'll describe the methodology. Based on the sampling frame provided by UBOS, there are about 78,000 um, enumeration areas across the entire country. And from these, we randomly selected 300 enumeration areas covering the 15 sub-regions of Uganda. Then in each of the selected enumeration areas, after the listing, we randomly selected 10 households. And this is based on the assumption that each enumeration area will have at least 100 to 150 um, households. With that, we, after the selection of the households, then we went to the specific household, got the household details, plus all those other members. Then we listed all the adults that reside in that location. And after that, we randomly selected one adult to be part of the panel or to participate in the baseline survey. For this person that accepted to participate in the baseline, after the collection of the data, the face-to-face -face collection of the baseline data, we sought the consent. Okay, there's something here with the, I think the, the speaker, some kind of interference. I don't know if it's from here. Yeah, but so after we uh, listed all the adults in that household, we selected one person then sought consent, and then that person was requested to join the panel. For 
those that accepted to join the panel, we then gave them, we placed one basic mobile phone, what we call Katochi. I know most of us here know that, at least I believe that. Then to keep that phone active, we also placed a solar charger in that village because it would not make sense to place a phone and then they can't charge that phone. So that person who then joined the panel is the person that we call every so often. Our, our model is that at least we call them once in a quarter. So in summary, the baseline was conducted in the last quarter of 2021, and we spoke to 300 um, households. Thank you. Okay, and we spoke to 300 uh, households. Then our sampling is random, multi-stage, because we have the overall country, the sub-regions, and then the different enumeration areas to cover, to represent the different sub-regions. The people we speak to are strictly Ugandans. So yes, we could be doing the survey, but we do not speak to non-Ugandans. Someone has to first tell us that they're Ugandan, then we select them on the panel. And these are adults who are 18 years and above. The locations that we cover are, when we go into the EA, we first test for the network signal in the different corners. So the locations that we go to have mobile phone coverage. And here you might think that, oh, okay, maybe Uganda is uh, doing badly in terms of um, telephone coverage. But for all the locations that we went to, we only discovered six EAs that had issues with the network. So majority, most of the locations were really um, sufficiently covered in terms of mobile connectivity. Then for the baseline, it was a face-to-face -face interface. Then for the subsequent co-rounds, this is done uh, using the computer-aided telephonic interviews. We have um, a call center with our research partner, Ipsos, and this call center has about 27 enumerators who speak different languages. So if at all you're not comfortable to be spoken to in English or um, another language, you, you, the respondent does tell us which language they're comfortable with, and that is the, the language that is used to execute this interview. Our sampling um, error, we have um, a plus or minus two with a 95% confidence interval. And this survey is funded fully by Tuaweza. So here, it's just to show you, when I mentioned that we list all the, the members, or we, we take note of every single person who lives in that household, we are able to see how that uh, plays out. And out of all the people that we listed, we had about 13,501 in the different households. And the reason I'm showing you this is just to show you that this mirrors what um, the UBOS data also has. Then where with the map of Uganda, where you see the, those orange dots, those are the different locations that we went to. And the reason I'm also mentioning that is that sometimes when we've shared the data, uh, we get questions like, which locations did you go to? Did you only go to Kampala? No. We covered all those places that you see, the, the orange dots. Then here, we just have the, the profile of the panel. And again, this looks similar to what you will get from the UBO statistics where we have slightly more female than male. Most of our people, 69% reside in the rural areas. Then we have uh, more younger people, as you can see here. Then a number of our people, 45%, have only attained um, some primary education. A number of them have actually not even attained any, have not gone to school at all. Then because we cover all the different um, locations, we also um, decided to split the data into the different regions. That is Geta Kampala, which is a pull out of the central. Then we have the eastern, northern, and western. So we are able to 
to see how that works, uh, how that plays into the different views that citizens hold in different parts of Uganda. Now, to the insights. I'm going to share 16 insights on the citizens' experiences of uh, business and taxation in Uganda. And I'll start with the business part. We asked a question. Have you owned a business in the last five years? And we see that 45% of Ugandans said yes. The other lot said no. And this bu these businesses are largely agricultural based. In terms of um, have they owned one or multiple businesses, for those that own businesses, the larger chunk of those own one business. Very few have multiple businesses. Then if someone mentioned that yes, they have owned a business in the last five years, we still asked, is that business still operating? And we see that 21% are the ones that say that that business is still operating. That is 21% of the Ugandans that we spoke to. Then um, on the issue of uh, whether these businesses are still operating and uh, the profile, this is just to show you that they are largely agricultural based and most of the business have uh, been in existence for about one to three years. Then um, most of them have one employee, it's a one man show. So we asked, um, for those that said that their businesses are no longer operating, what was the main reason for that closure? And the main reason stated by half of those that owned uh, was the lack of capital. Then there were other mentions like low demand or market. Then they also mentioned the high cost of inputs. They mentioned high competition. Then 10% mentioned COVID-related reasons. So for those that still have their businesses operating, the 21%, we asked, what are the three main challenges that they experience as business owners? And 63%, again, most of them mentioned that accessing capital is the key challenge. They mention other cost-related challenges like uh, getting transport, the cost of capital, that is the interest rate, uh, getting equipment or materials, and then high taxes and levies is fifth mentioned at 17%. There are also other mentions. So we also try to understand um, how would they best describe the status of their business? And we looked at the data we had in 2019 when we asked the same question to our pan of 2000 and then compared it with the 2022 uh, data. And here we see that those that say that their business is growing has declined from 42% to 36%. And we see that when you look at the, the different regions, in Greater Kampala, that's where we see the highest mention of their businesses growing, followed by uh, the other part of the central region. Then we also see um, fairly higher mentions in the western uh, part of Uganda. Then those with the lowest um, proportion of businesses saying that they are growing are largely in the northern part of Uganda, followed by the eastern part of Uganda. Then we again asked another question, just to understand what is their overall perspective of on the ease of doing business in Uganda. Then we, we compared, again, the data from 2019 and 2022. Here we see that the proportion 
of those that are saying that the ease of doing business in Uganda, that it's easy, we see that this number has slightly gone up from 28% to 33%. And we also see that uh, when we look at the different demographic uh, profiles, women are more likely to say that uh, it's easy to do business in Uganda compared to the men. The rural population was also more inclined to say that compared to the urban population. Then also the younger people had a higher mention of saying that this it's easy to do business in Uganda. Then when we look at the different regions, the people from the eastern part of Uganda, a half of them, slightly over half, mentioned that it's easy to do business in Uganda, and that was at 52%. So for those that say that it's difficult, the key mention, uh, it's not in this chart here, but the key mention they uh, gave was that there is a lack of capital, and then um, the, some of them did mention that business is hard. For those that say that it's hard, that um, this is because of the high taxes and then the high price of input. So capital is playing a key role in whether people perceive the business to be difficult or easy. Now to the citizens' views on taxation. We asked a question. What taxes, mandatory fees, dues that citizens pay are you aware of? And we did not prompt. We let them just mention that. And the most mentioned was VAT at 69%. Then later on, when we did some prompting, that number went up to 88%. They mention other taxes, like unofficial levies. They mention presumptive tax. This is mentioned by 20% unprompted. Then there is the local service tax, which is also mentioned at 14%. Then also have the pay as you earn, the rental tax, land and building that is property tax. Then there are also some mentions of, uh, say, the submissions they give to for NSSF. When it comes to which taxes are they paying, 69% mentioned that they pay VAT. Then the next most mentioned was the unofficial levies. We see other slightly higher mentions of uh, the presumptive tax at 9%, and then we see the local service tax being mentioned by 6% that they actually paying that. I know that in the room, most people here might be familiar with the issues to do with taxation. I must admit that I'm also not, I'm not a tax expert, but we thought let's ask and see what people think about these different taxes. And we asked them a question, um, are these collected at the national level or local level, because that can, that can sort of uh, play in the sight of someone who is going to pay taxes. And we see that when it comes to what they consider to be national, they say VAT is collected by the national government, customs duties, pay as you and those are highly mentioned, and then the NSSF, the money they give for NSSF. Then when it comes to the local, the highest mention was uh, the unofficial levies. But we see that still the citizens mention that uh, there is rental tax, 38%, believe that that is collected at the local level. Then uh, land and building or property tax, that that goes to the local district. Then the presumptive tax goes to the local district. Then they also mention the local service tax. I believe that the, the team from URA can now will have a chance to tell us what the correct thing is. Because if citizens are not clear on that, then their willingness to perform their duty of paying taxes will probably be lower. 
So we asked, uh, there's a, a small chart there, which is uh, uh, just showing us, we asked a question about utilities. Because in 2019, when we collected the similar data, we asked which taxes uh, they are paying. Most of them mentioned utilities. So we wanted to understand, since they mentioned in, the, uh, in 2019 that it's utilities, what would they say now, if at all we specifically requested them to give us information on utilities? And here, we see that 43% of the people that we spoke to across the entire country say that they are not aware that there is a tax that is paid on utilities. Then we see that 52% uh, say that they are aware that they do pay some taxes on utilities. Then for those that are aware, we try to uh, again understand what are those taxes that you pay on utilities. And 35% mentioned that they pay VAT. The rest, they did not know. So here we again asked a question. Why do you or other people pay taxes? And we see that 64% said that they pay taxes because they expect that this will help in service delivery. Then 27% say that they pay because it's compulsory. So the main motivation is that they expect that services will be, public services will be improved. In other words, if at all there is an issue there, expect that the citizens will have uh, some discomfort in paying taxes. If at all, maybe they think some things might not, uh, are not working right for them. So uh, with those same statements, that is those that mentioned to help uh, in service delivery and also because it is compulsory, we just looked at the different demographics to see who is most likely to say help in service delivery. And we see that the, the wealthier are the ones who are most likely to be motivated to pay taxes because of improve, improvement in service delivery. Then we, when we come to those that say it's compulsory, the poorer population is most likely to mention that they pay because it's compulsory. Then we posed uh, a number of questions, a number of statements to just understand where does the Ugandans' mind sit on these issues. Do they agree or they disagree? And we had a statement, tax is important for national success or, and economics. Here we see that 84% did agree. And this number has slightly gone up from 79% in 2019 when we posed a similar question. Then we also had another statement. Tax is a civic duty and should be paid regardless of the quality of service. The proportion that agree with this statement has also slightly gone up to 67% from 52%. Then we had another statement. Taxes are high, so evasion is a necessity for many. On that specific one, things did not change much. It's just a, a percentage drop. But remember we mentioned our, uh, um, our margins of error, what we are working with, so this does not really uh, change much here. Then we also had the, the last statement here is a Avoiding tax is understandable if services provided by government are poor. We see that less people agree with this. And that, that is a, a drop from 56% to 48%. So in summary, we see that citizens are increasingly recognizing the importance of paying tax and are growing less likely to support tax evasion. We had 
two other statements where we again ask them to state whether they agree or disagree. And these statements are, I would cheat on tax if I had the chance. Then the second one is, I would happily pay taxes without enforcement. What you see up here, the 46 percent, is um, the figure from 2019, which was um, the proportion of people that agreed that for them they would cheat on tax if they had the chance. And that number has now gone down to 30 percent. Then we have the other contradictory view where we see that um, among those that say I would happily pay taxes with no enforcement, this number has again dropped. So fewer citizens now say they would cheat on taxes if they had the chance. However, fewer also say they would happily pay taxes without any enforcement. So this is an apparent contradiction and it likely reflects the tension citizens feel, wanting to do the right thing, but also recognizing that there is a pain when they're paying the taxes. So for those that would pay um, taxes without any enforcement, some of the key things that we, we picked out is that um, they would do it simply to, to, because they have a desire to contribute to development. Then those that would cheat if they had the chance, 9% say that they want to save and do other things, which I believe applies in our day-to-day -day life. So while the main reason uh, given for willingness to pay taxes without in enforcement is to contribute to the development and improvement of uh, public service delivery, those that uh, would not, it's because they basically want to save some money. Then on the issue of tax um, evasion, he wanted to find out, uh, do they think that tax evasion is high? Do they think it's medium or do they think it's a rare thing? And we see that 30% say that tax evasion is high. 14% say it's medium. And this you can compare to 10% who say that it's very rare and 26% who say it's very low. So Ugandans are saying, more Ugandans, most citizens are saying tax evasion in Uganda is common. The less that are saying that it's rare. So we ask the question, why do you think people avoid or evade taxes? 46% say that people feel tax rates on earnings are too high. Then 22% say that people feel underpaid and they do not want to lose money. Then 21% say that people feel taxes are not spent efficiently. So this is the last slide I'll be showing on the issues related to taxation. We pose the number of statements just to again understand where is the citizen, uh, where is their mind on this. Statement, government is capable of prosecuting tax evaders. The figures did not change much between 2019 and 2022. It's still half of the population, of the adult population that says that government is capable of prosecuting tax evaders. Then when we come to the statement, all taxes, fees, and fines collected are spent wisely. We've seen a slight increase in those that agree with that statement. 29% mentioned that in 2019 that they agree, and this number went up in 2022 to 36% that agree that all taxes, fees, and fines collected are spent wisely. Then on the statement, you understand what the taxes are spent on. 
Here, we see that there's a slight drop in those that say that they understand what the, uh, the taxes they, they pay are spent on. That is from 32% to 27%. Then there is a statement, the current tax rates are fair. We saw a drastic drop from 33% who said they agree with that to 13% who say that they agree that the current tax rates are fair. So with all that willingness, uh, that desire to see that service uh, delivery is improved, those that want to do the right thing, they still say that they feel that the tax rates are not fair. Which probably leaves us with the question, do they clearly understand these taxes? And do they know what uh, these taxes are spent on? So a lot for us to really deliberate on in terms of um, why they would think it's, it's not fair. Now to the last section on views uh, about URA, because we, we felt that it was, we would not ask questions on taxation and not ask questions around uh, the tax collection body. So we asked, are you aware or have you heard of the Uganda Revenue Authority? We didn't translate it, just like that. Are you aware of Uganda Revenue Authority? And yeah, I, could, I could mention that the team had the desire to kind of translate that. They thought that maybe if they translate it, then it would <laughs> mean something else. But no, this is a name of a body. You cannot translate that. And if you do, you'd be leading then. So just as it is, we see that 70% say that they are aware of the Uganda Revenue Authority. Then when we look at the gender here, we see that 77% um, of the men said that they were aware of Uganda Revenue Authority compared to 63% of the women who said they were aware of the Uganda Revenue Authority. Then when we look at the rural urban uh, split, we see that the urban dwellers, the urbanites are more aware of URA compared to the rural dwellers who mention uh, they, are, they, are, they are aware, and this was 65% compared to the 81%. Then we also see that for our older generation, the older uh, Ugandans, 55 and above, these had the lowest proportion of people that say that they are aware of URA. Then from 44 downwards, we had higher awareness levels of URA. Then again, unsurprisingly, the wealthier are more aware of URA compared to the poorer um, folks in the country. Then again, unsurprisingly, those that are, have attained at least secondary education and higher are more aware compared to those that have not attained that education level. Then when we look at the different regions, that is Greater Kampala, the Central Region, Eastern, Northern, and Western, we see that the highest awareness levels are in the central region, followed by Greater Kampala. Then we have the eastern at 70%, then the northern at 64%, and the western at 57%. So at this point, I think that's when I would uh, look at the, the team from URA. Is the outreach even in the different regions? but I guess you can speak to, uh, to that later. So we asked um, what services does URA do? What is their work? We see that 50% correctly mentioned that URA collects taxes. Then we see 3% um, mention 
they prevent smuggling. 2% mention they import, they import and export, uh, do import and export clearance. Then 2% mention that they seize unregistered vehicles. Then 1% mention road construction. Again, 1%. Others mention still at 1% providing services to citizens, verifying the quality of products. Then uh, they provide security. Here, I guess uh, your guess is as good as mine, that they watch the campaign, they see yeah, Uganda, they see the roads, they see the pictures of a woman in the hospital, and because they haven't taken time to read that or even the, our literacy levels are lower, they just assume that, ah, uh, that logo, you are, yeah, I've seen it somewhere. Those people do this. When we look at the um, different regions, in terms of those that say you are a does this, we see that those that uh, had the highest mention that you are collect taxes were in Greater Kampala at 74%, then followed by Eastern Uganda at 48%. The others had a lower uh, percentage. So we asked the, the citizens, have you had contact with URA? Only 5% said they had had contact with URA. The rest, 65% uh, said they had not contacted URA, even if they were aware. Then the other 30%, they are not aware of URA, which is generally understandable because we have a lot of um, informality in our businesses, but also even those that are not necessarily in business, those that are just employed, a number of them have not embraced some, some issues, some items, that some uh, areas that they need to work on in terms of being tax compliant. So how do they contact URA? That is among the 5% that had contacted URA. 74% said they visit the office. The other mention was the call center. Then most of them had contacted URA at least two years, over two years ago. And what was the purpose? To get a team. Then 16% mentioned tax clearance, but there was a higher mention for getting a team. And in terms of how do they rate URA, 48% said it is good. Then we have 39% who say that it is average. Then 13% have some concerns in terms, with, uh, in terms of the interaction that they had, URA. So um, for those that contacted URA because they wanted to get uh, a TIN, um, we, we still went further to, uh, to find out if people had tried to update or register a TIN. And we see that only 4% have tried to register a TIN. Then for those that did make that attempt, how did they try to do this? Most of them contacted a URA officer. That is 64%. Then 26% said that they did this online. And 11% said that they did this through a tax consultant. Then we asked them, were you charged? Because I know that is a, a, a common thing that whenever I say I went to this office, someone will instantly ask you, did you pay any money? So 38% said that they were charged. And uh, the average amount was about 43,500. The larger chunk of them said they were not charged. So I believe that here, um, URA will say more about this, whether people should be charged or they should not be charged. 
because we have members of the press here, I think it's important that we are clear on what a citizen should expect when they contact URA. Then um, overall, how would they rate the performance of URA? 20% said it's good, then 11% said it was bad. Then when we look at the, the rating of good, we see that more men, um, we had a higher proportion of men saying that the URA performance is good compared to the women. This we could relate to uh, probably how many women are in formal businesses or formal arrangements that imply that they have to have dealings with URA. Then when we look at the different regions, we see that Greater Kampala had the highest mention of those that say that the performance of URA is good at 26%. Then the rest were at about 20%. That is the central region, the northern, western, and then the least, the one with the lowest percentage was the eastern region. That is at 18%, not far from the 20%. So why do they rate the performance of URA as good? It's because the, they believe that URA collects taxes that help in service delivery. Then those that rate it as bad, they have a number of mentions. They have increased taxes on all goods. They are corrupt. They harass people. Then 1% say um, they don't provide services after collecting taxes. The reason we are sharing this, it's to show you where the citizen's mind is. Some of those are so far from the truth, so we need to get more clarity. Because if we know where the citizen is seated in terms of perceptions around uh, taxation, then we know what we need to do to ensure that we can foster the desire for them to join the tax bracket. So to conclude, the key business challenge is access to capital. That even with the closures during the lockdowns, COVID-19 has low mentions as a reason for closure. We see that far fewer citizens agree now in, uh, in 2022 that taxes are fair compared to those that said that in 2029. However, we have seen with the different statements on are they willing to pay taxes, why do they pay taxes, that there is growing support for taxation in principle. However, we have seen that there is evidence of low understanding of taxation, starting with the tax board you saw that slide that had, what does URA do? A number of them said, gave responses that are not what we know URA does. And again, still with the different taxes, we have quite low awareness levels, where we only see 69% that mention VAT. The other taxes, they are really very low percentages. And I think um, for me, that probably calls for uh, more action from URA, especially reaching those that are not yet even in the tax bracket. Like in the schools, are the children aware of taxation? Do they know the different taxes? I've seen somewhere in their curriculum that it is a component in there. But if we asked maybe even the team here, the group here, I'm sure a random question would give you some surprising answers. Then um, it's important to note that the proportion of women who interface with URA is low due to the large informality, the large proportion who have uh, informal businesses. So hence it does not surprise me a lot that fewer women mention URA. 
And now the question to us is how do we get them into uh, formalizing their businesses? Then tax evasion is believed to be common with half of the citizens believing that government is capable of prosecuting the evaders. So in a nutshell, that is what we wanted to share today. And we believe that there is more room to really uh, discuss this data, dissect it further. Hence the reason as to why we do not uh, have recommendations because we have experts in the room that can deliberate on this further and then we can move away with some concrete actions for each and every one of us. This data is available on the Traweza website as well as the brief and it's free for use by anyone and those are the, the links to that. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, next, we will have um, from Isaac Arnitwe from the Ministry uh, of Finance. As he comes, the team will prepare two, they are called Vox Pops videos uh, that we'll watch thereafter. And then I will hand over the microphone to Raymond Mujuni, who will be uh, helping us to talk to the specialists in the house. So Isaac, uh, you're welcome. Isaac is representing the uh, Honel Minister. Why? Oh, OK. You will say the best you can in that direction. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is uh, Isaac Arine Itwe. I'm a senior economist in tax policy department, Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. I want to set one record straight. I'm not here in the capacity of a minister of finance, no. I'm here in the capacity of a senior economist in the Ministry of Finance. So, but first and foremost, I want to extend the apologies of the minister. He had planned to attend this event. He had planned to attend this event. I had a chat with him last evening and he hoped to be here with us today. But the ministry has commenced preparations for the national budget for financial year 2023-24. There is a national budget conference taking place right now at the Kororo Independence Grounds, I think. That's where he that's where he is right now, but he sent his apologies. So as a Ministry of Finance, we are pleased to join you this morning, all the people who are here. Um, sincere apologies. I have to recognize the honorary members of parliament who are here. The Commission as General Uganda Revenue Authority or his representative officials from uh, ministries, departments, and agencies, members of civil society, fraternity, representatives of the academia, members of the press, and other invited guests. So we, the ministry congratulates the organizers upon successfully organizing this launch, where the findings of citizens' perception on our tax environment have been disseminated. We are happy also to know that this work has been done jointly with Uganda Revenue Authority. And as a ministry, 
we commend useful collaboration with stakeholders, particularly civil society organizations that complement government efforts. Therefore, we want to thank Tuaweza, of course, and Uganda Revenue Authority for harnessing such collaborations which create a platform through which stakeholders can usefully engage with government, especially in its efforts towards streamlining its efforts for domestic revenue mobilization. We also recognize that um, improved efforts of revenue generation are the cornerstone of sustainable growth and development of our country. So this launch is very relevant in terms of helping government of Uganda to achieve its revenue objectives, but also at the same time gives stakeholders an opportunity to provide useful feedback and advice to government on areas where we need to improve. We would like to observe the following, number one, that government of Uganda has registered significant success in terms of uh, domestic revenue mobilization, particularly by taking some of the following reforms, reforms such as enacting enabling laws and policies, putting in place institutions for accountability, these institutions uh, uh, particularly Uganda Revenue Authority, and then of course the adoption of ICT as a means to enforce compliance and also to streamline tax paying processes. And these efforts, among others, have led to growth in revenues from 10.2% 10, 10 of GDP in the financial year 2014-15 to 12.9% in financial year 18-19. This was the last financial year before the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. So our second observation is that this revenue performance momentum was disrupted by the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. We instituted a lot of um, measures to curb the spread, which included lockdowns. These grossly and negatively impacted on the levels of economic activity. And in the financial year 1920, government registered a paltry growth in revenues of 3%. And the revenue effort as a percentage of GDP declined to 12.6%. Along the way, we've seen uh, resilience because in, in the following financial year, we registered growth in revenue efforts of up to 13 0.5%. So the growth to 13.5% in the last in the just concluded year is against the backdrop of those impacts on the economy of the measures instituted to curb the spread of COVID-19 pandemic. But then also as an indication of economic recovery following the fully reopening of all sectors that generate economic output, and then, of course, repurposing of the budget to focus on strategic areas. In addition to continuous improvements in efficiency of tax administration to enforce compliance. Therefore, to that end, in financial year 23-24, we hope to improve our revenue to GDP ratio to 14.1%. The last two months, July and August, we've registered uh, 
a very robust performance, many thanks to the efforts by Uganda Revenue Authority. I think we registered um, a combined surplus of 130 billion in the first two months. So you can see we are on track to 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 improve our revenue efforts or our projection of 14.1 percent. Now, this evidence of economic recovery has also been pointed out in the in the presentation that Mary just made, which showed that percent uh, of the youth indicated that their businesses are performing well. And then also 42% of the youth also indicated that Uganda uh, has, Uganda has created an environment in which it is easy to do business. So when you have an environment where it is easy to do business, then obviously the levels of economic activity um, will crop up which form our base for revenue generation. Now, observation number three is that we have for financial 2022-23, a budget of 48 trillion as appropriated by Parliament. But of that, of that 48, we expected to finance it to the tune of 25.5 trillion using our internally generated resources. Here we are talking about tax revenue and non-tax revenue. Now this is the equivalent of 53%. So this 53% which we are going to generate from our citizens is the only sustainable way of financing our development needs. Therefore, feedback on the perception of our tax system, both at policy level and at administration level, are important because when addressed, improve the tax paying morale with a view to enhancing our revenue potential for greater self-reliance in financing economic development while reducing dependence on debt. Somewhere the results indicated that um, one of the one of the of the bottlenecks is high tax rates. We take this back as the Ministry of Finance. We recently we had um, an engagement with stakeholders in the tourism industry and they informed us of multiple rates, fiscal charges which are, which are applicable to their industry, both tax and non-tax revenue. And helped us appreciate that we need some work in that area to try and coordinate better with uh, the Ministry of Local Government and all local governments so that our tax regimes are well aligned um, to keep the effective tax rates of business is lower to facilitate business growth and business growth and expansion. So our last observation is that from the results presented, 69%, 30%, and 35% of respondents mentioned uh, access to capital. The cost of capital and the cost of transport respectively as their major constraints to business. Now, government is aware of uh, 
of these constraints, although we are happy that we are being reminded. So government has uh, undertaken a number of measures in the past and in the current financial year to address those three challenges, specifically on access to working capital, government is implementing, effectively this financial year, is implementing the parish development model. And the main objective is to avail working capital or cheaper financing, especially citizens in the lowest income bracket. But in addition to that, government has been implementing other programs through schemes such as the NYOGA, financing of circles through microfinance support center. Last year, we introduced the intro introduced small business recovery fund. There's been the agricultural credit facility, among others. And all these have been aimed at providing financing for people to do business. Now, these schemes and these finances are available to everyone, including SMEs. So I thought that feedback should also be taken by the people who are here. Then equally, the issue of transport, of course there is still some work to be done, but over the last decade, government has invested quite heavily in infrastructure development, specifically in road construction to try and solve this bottleneck. And recently, or last year, we have shown definitely reduces the cost of doing business. So in conclusion, um, We will depend on how close the link between uh, paying taxes and how they are used by government is perceived by the taxpayers. Because we also, we saw from the results which have, which have just been disseminated that people are encouraged to pay because they hope to get better services in return. Therefore, they are more, their taxpaying morale depends largely on the perception of how, how well or how best or how efficiently their resources or their taxes are being spent in terms of service delivery. Therefore, it is very important and it reaffirms government efforts and its commitment and responsibility to strengthen the fiscal social contract by fighting corruption at all levels. And then, of course, government is committed to simplifying further and making relevant improvements in our tax systems, both at policy level, at and adding to any further voluntary taxpayer compliance. The data which has been shared today, or the results which have been shared today, Come I mean, in very timely, as I've informed you, government today through the National Budget Conference has kick-started the new budget cycle, the budget for financial 2023-24. So the results, all the information we receive today will be used to form basis for decision-making during this planning phase. Of course, we also like to reaffirm
government's commitment to ensure that the citizens' voices are heard and their feedback is critical, is of critical importance for decision making in government. We thank you very much, and oh God and my country. Let's give him another hand clap. Thank you. Um, my team of videos, are we ready? Okay, so I want to give that about um, five to seven minutes, and then we'll take it to the next level. So after the videos, um, I wanted to reference uh, a writer called um, Mark Shields. Uh, he wrote an essay uh, titled The People Have Spoken and uh, as to whether uh, that scientifically applies what we've had, we'll be having people who are with us in this house, four of them, experts, five of them, and they will be dissecting for us how this data speaks to the essay that the people have spoken and all what they think the country needs to do in that direction. If the videos are delay, are you on? Okay. Let's have about five to seven minutes and then we'll get to our discussions. Thank you. I know for sure that every product that I buy has some sort of tax levied on it. And so whether it's me as an individual or the company that's selling me the product that bears that button, I'm contributing one way or another. I also know about pay as you earn uh, for people that have employment, nine to five jobs like I do. I know for sure that every product that I buy has some sort of tax levied on it. And so whether it's me as an individual or the company that's selling me the product that bears that button, I'm contributing one way or another. I also know about pay as you earn uh, for people that have employment, nine to five jobs like I do. I know there is some sort of tax that I pay, but I'd be lying if I claim to know what it's called or how much I'm paying on those different utilities. I believe that as a citizen, when I pay taxes, the government then uses that money to be able to provide for me other forms of services. So the roads that I drive on, paying the different uh, public servants, that comes from taxpayers' money. So that comes from the money that me and the million other citizens who pay are contributing to the country. Yes, I've owned a business in the last five years. I still do operate the same business up to now. I would say, uh, first and foremost, it is um, the very unreliable landlords we have. Um, they seem to wake up with different ideals of the day. So you wake up today, you are a legit tenant, and um, your landlord seems to not agree with that and will just either increase the rent or fire you from the premises just like that. The other challenge I face is the unreliable market trends and uh, that just like that you sort of you know bring all these items because the market has you know uh, sort of taken that trend and out of the blue there are no more clients uh, looking for that particular good or that particular service. The third one I think that I would say challenges me is uh, the very many taxes that come with these goods and services. Uh, very unpredictable, very, um, they just spring them up on you like that and it's so hard to make 
sense of that with the money that comes in. that we've watched. I think we'll start here and then. perceive ourselves and how we are seen outside from the outside so it's a good opportunity especially for soul searching areas for improvement and uh, identify what is working and what's not working when you say soul searching what does that look like uh, for the revenue authority there is this service that you are giving and uh, you've uh, just launched rolled out the tin is free or the instant tin application on your side, as the tax administrator, you think it is working very well. But on the other side, the, the person using the tool is maybe having a problem uh, with that particular tool. So to measure the service, uh, inward looking and outward looking gives us uh, a 360 view on how effective we are, how efficient we are. And those are key measures on the performance of the tax administration. All right, thank you. Um, so Thank you very much for that question, Raymond, and thanks to the researchers for this wonderful work. The key issues that I think are pertinent from the findings are one, I would expect more engendering of the research. Uh, there is a, a rather slight mention of the gender aspects of the findings. And quite a lot of research has been done, for instance, to prove that uh, women are more compliant than men. Um, I would have expressed some more gender aspects and key conclusions uh, based on gender. Second, I also established that majority of the people who were interviewed were in the agricultural sector. Now to the tax policy, we have already ba battled with ourselves how, does, how, do we, how much do we tax agriculture? 
Okay, you have a sector employing over 60 percent of the Ugandans, contributing so much to GDP, but contributing so little to tax. And these are the people who are appearing in the research. So if they are appearing in research and they are involved in agriculture, how does it point to the fact that uh, agriculture is taxed to what extent? So the tax policy should think about that and triangulate the result to inform uh, tax policy. The most other interesting fact that uh, the representative of uh, the Minister of Finance has alluded to, again pointing to the findings, is a question we have always asked as researchers, do tax rates matter? Does a lower tax rate translate into more tax morale and revenue generation? And from these findings, when you, you look at the contradictions in the findings, the number of people who are saying the tax rates are fair has gone down to 13%. However, the perception on the, on, on the URA as an institution is generally improving. You are also finding that uh, the motivation to pay tax is about service delivery, not necessarily the tax rate. So as a researcher and a policy person, again, the question is, do we mind about tax rate or we should work hard to expand the tax base? And the, and the representative has ably told you, sometimes we conceive that the size of the tax register is the tax base, as in the number of people for the tax register, for the tax or person is the tax base. And yet that's not the case. The case is tax base is the number of economic activities from which you can generate tax. So government intervention should target expanding economic activities from where tax can be collected. When we are at that level, then the rest cease to matter. Also, when we are at a level where we can deliver service to the people and they are satisfied, the motivation or morale to pay tax will improve. So think about uh, think about access. And I was happy at this financial year when the government was categorical, saying with the COVID-19 recovery, uh, we are not going to adjust or increase tax rates. And you've heard from uh, the horse's mouth that there have been improvements in collections. So it answers the question on research, do tax rates matter? Can we have lower tax rates, but a wider base? And it also points to the current interventions. When you look at the results, they're talking about agriculture and, and the intervention in terms of financial inclusion currently in the budget with the parish involvement more than the rest is targeting agriculture. How does that relate to the current intervention in the government in terms of monetizing the agricultural sector so that you make it more productive and be able to, to tax it to support the, the, the rest of the organization? I'll come back later, but I have many insights from the results. They are very intriguing. Thank you. All right. Uh, he, uh, Mr. Frank? Robert, please. Uh, Mr. Frank. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Raymond. Uh, my name is Francis Robert Kawuye from the Federation of Small and Medium Enterprises in Uganda. Now, from the findings uh, of the report, I want to comment that we've, uh, it has been observed that it's only the agriculture sector which, is, which survived, which managed to survive the wrath of uh, COVID-19 and also in the past five years. So this is probably alluded to the fact that, according to my conclusion, it's alluded to the fact that, uh, first of all, the cost of doing business in the agriculture sector is not as high as it is in, in the other sectors. For instance, you have free land available. You don't have a lot of inputs. Uh, you don't have to buy a lot of inputs. Probably you have spillovers from the previous harvest. And so that is probably why the agriculture sector managed to survive or to, to, to uh, then when it comes to the other sectors, of course, most of them are struggling. And it has also been highlighted in the research the findings, the number of uh, enterprises that are growing is less than the number of enterprises that are, actually the number of enterprises that, that are declining is bigger than the number of enterprises that are growing. So I would urge government or any other player in this case to think about provision of capital or finances. It has been highlighted in the research uh, report and this is a key issue that is affecting most of our SMEs. They are struggling to survive. In fact, in the, fa in the past five years, as it has been highlighted, very few business al bu businesses have been created. This is because of the high cost of uh, capital, high costs of uh, production, and starting up a business. So we need an intervention, a serious intervention from government side to ensure that uh, most of the SMEs can really uh, resilient and uh, uh, survive. Uh, on the side of Uganda Revenue Authority, 
most of the most of the SMEs actually want to pay taxes. They don't have they don't they don't want to evade taxes, but they need to see value for money. Where is the accountability? If you're collecting taxes, where are you investing this money? How are you using the money? So there is need by uh, URA to provide, and government in this case, to provide more accountability to the citizens, to the taxpayers, so that SMEs can also be uh, incentivized to uh, pay taxes. So briefly, that's what I can talk about right now. All right. We're going to come back to you uh, around formalization of businesses, but since you asked government, um, there's government right next to you. Um, Honorable, um, what are your own impressions uh, from um, the survey? I had asked Mr. Isaac to be part of this panel, reading the government questions, but you need to sit there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, morning to you all. Moderator, I I you recognize the presence of the Mr. Person from Top Finance Parliament of Uganda. It's because she came late, she would be the best placed person to sit here. Honorable Jane Pachito, she's the vice chairperson of the Comito Finance. And uh, she is more in this field. Nevertheless, I need to, to thank the teachers. Really, you did your part. And uh, the representative of the Minister of Finance, the economist, team and the, if we were a very serious government, this research would move us some mile. If we were a very serious government, this research would push us somewhere. This economy is not an industry economy. This is an economy that is based on businesses, and most of our businesses are informal. This research But every information has been put. In fact, at the end of the day, I would request, if we could, to our and And equally, since he's the vice chairperson for Committee of Finances here, Parliament of Uganda, you could equally hold a very serious discussion with the Committee of Finance. So that when you do your research, it doesn't end on paper. It doesn't end here in our discussion. We must see tangible results out of this discussion. You put effort to cut out these research things. You put resources are put, but we need to see value. Because at the end of the day, why this NGO is doing this is to punch in and help government bridge that gap where government is not doing its part so that we see better life for Ugandans. The key things that I noted, as my colleagues have really spelled out, that uh, the research you realize was so much on, uh, you discovered that much of the sector or business sector that was going on was agriculture. Because you see the backbone, you could not find industries. In any case, you would not get better information from the industrialists. You would only get better information from the agriculture sector. But equally, the agriculture sector would have been better if the a colleague said here that there are few inputs that are used in agriculture. Agriculture is not kicking off simply because we are not adopting to that required technology. We are still using the rudimentary methods that we have my mother, my father, those other people we are doing in Ibugavula South in Kamuli. We need to adopt to the current technology demands so that if we have to put input, if Russia is uh, having issues with the DAP that is used in the fertilizing and so on and maize, we get another solution. So we need to move that area. But all in all, as, uh, because we shall have another discussion, you saw, like, last video, the lady was saying we have unreliable landlords that wake up tomorrow. She, the landlord sees the business prospering, not knowing the effort the owner of the business has put in to see it grow 
and not be the landlord not only being there to support the owner of the business to grow the business, but when the landlord realizes the business is prospering, he wakes up and says, "Now our rent is three million from one million, unreliable." You find the the lady was equal talking about taxes that are unpredictable. The other day, the ta the tax people are here. The other day in my constituency, people were striking in Kamuli. You wake up today, find the shop. You have not assessed properly, lock the shop, not even knowing that you are locking the shop, but the owner of the shop sleeps in that shop. You get it? So there are things that we must have. You saw the younger man saying that uh, I, I, I know the taxes, I other taxes I don't know, but I expect his service delivery to be good. If the service delivery was perfect, what I realized in this research, Ugandans have no problem with paying taxes because they expect a better service delivery. But at the moment service delivery is not to date to their expectation, then you find other areas. Though the area of uh, evading taxes, there are these big shots that are evading taxes. These small men are squeezed and small women are squeezed. These tax, the KCCA people go, bundle them, throw them on these vehicles, uh, they close the shops. But the big, big shots of this country, the ministers and so on, those ones are the ones that are evading taxes. We need to get a clear formula of how to, to bring them to, because they are the ones that have big businesses. They are the ones that would even bring in more money. But with their big businesses, they are the ones that are evading taxes. Then the smaller men with the smaller businesses are the ones that are meeting the tax burden that he has to see the small, small few things that are here. But since the, this one has denied that he's not representing the minister, but since he's from the Minister of Finance, we need to really move together. This is a very serious discussion if the Minister of Finance picked interest. My, the, the, my lady, the researcher, said that he's on the website. Moderator, Ugandans, you put information on the website and you expect them to go and read it there. Which Uganda? We are going to try and disseminate um, a lot of this research, and I, I know that Waweza does this a lot. Uh, Isaac, um, the, the opening remarks of Henry there were that uh, government is not serious. Um, I, I didn't want you to punch him, so I, I, I'll give you a chance to respond to it. But on insight number six, 50% um, of Ugandans say doing business is hard. That's almost half of the people doing business. Um, what is it that the Minister of Finance is looking into to make the business climate easy for Ugandans? Thank you very much. It's very useful feedback. There is a project that the Ministry has been implementing together with uh, uh, the Private Sector Development Unit at the Ministry URSB, KCCA, and I don't remember very well the other collaborators, but the project is aimed at, uh, the actually the theme of the project is ease of doing business. Help in formalization, streamlining of processes such as registration, and so on and so forth. But our understanding of um, why indeed it is difficult to do businesses in, to do business in Uganda goes beyond the processes. I think it goes way into the ingredients that you need to do business, particularly on the cost of doing business. When a person in our understanding wants to do business, number one, the key motivation is the profit after tax, if I may say it that way. Now, this profit is as a result of, of the market. Yeah, so first and foremost, they identify an opportunity where they believe they will get the market identify an opportunity where they will, of course there are so many other factors that come into play, the political stability and so on and so forth. But then there are other enablers, like they pointed out the cost of credit. Cost of credit is high in Uganda. 
it is not high for only small businesses, it is also high for larger firms. But government recognizes this. And government for large firms, especially those involved in manufacturing, agro-processing, and so on and so forth, government provided for a scheme through the Uganda Development Bank. I think through the Uganda Development Bank, they can access credit cheaper than what is available in the market. Now, because government identifies agriculture as the backbone of the economy, a few years ago, about four or five, introduced the agricultural credit facility. It has been running specifically to avail cheaper finance for agriculture. There are so many commercial banks who are participating in this scheme, but that also has been uh, mainly aimed at availing cheaper credit for, for people who are involved in agriculture. Now, beyond that, there are so several other schemes that, I, like I mentioned earlier, through which government has tried to help, especially the smaller groups, to get organized in a way, get formalized to a certain level, and then access some credit. And this has mainly been through circles. Government started that by uh, extending that financing through microfinance support center. But along the way, there are other programs which have come, like the, the Youth Livelihood Fund. No, the women, there is something about the women, there is something for the youth, and then most recently, the parish development model. So government take, takes cognizance of all those factors and it's been um, doing a number of things to address them. Mm. I, Isaac, when you're speaking, I, I wanted you to look at the face of Francis because he's, he's from the Federation of Small and Medium Enterprises. Um, Francis, tell us about the, the SMEs and access to this government credit. Um, credit lines at UDB, the credit that government puts out, even the parish development model. Uh, well, to start with, of course, I understand government put in place a recovery fund for SMEs uh, in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. But it's absurd, and I have to, to say it in the face of my colleague here, SMEs are failing to access this money. The, 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 the requirements are so high to be actually availed by the SMEs. So this money is lying in the banks and it's not meeting its uh, uh, intended objective. So we need the Minister of Finance to come up with probably better alternative uh, measures or ways through which SMEs can access this money because it's not meeting its objectives. Then secondly, we also need to look at some of these government programs are not, they don't seem to be aligned. We are talking about PDM uh, the parish development model, which is also going to be implemented in Kampala, if I'm, if I'm not. Uh, but it's again in the same area in Kampala that government is implementing the smart city. We have been following up as the federation some of the effects of the smart city policy. And the SMEs have been affected so, so hugely by this policy. Most of the micro-businesses, the vendors that we are talking about in this report, the saloon owners, kiosk owners, those small businesses where a person has invested maybe five, five, five million shillings and she has started up a business, the lady, the woman we are talking about, they have been affected, they have been thrown out of the city. Then you are talking about implementing this PDM. We thought, I mean, this money is supposed to be given to these small businesses that you're pushing out of the city. So how is it going to be implemented? How is the policy going to be implemented? This is something that government also needs to look at to ensure that the PDM money in Kampala is received by the intended beneficiaries. Otherwise, the businesses that will end up receiving this money in Kampala will be the big ones, not the ones that are being targeted. So he has also talked about the agricultural credit facility, something something to do with agriculture. Uh, this, this fund, of course, has supported most of the agricultural entrepreneurs, the people in the agricultural businesses, 
to probably survive, and uh, I want to applaud government for that. And also the uh, private financial institutions. They have, most of them are down, deep down there in the villages giving credit to agricultural entrepreneurs. And this is also a plus to the private sector. But we need more interventions. We need more interventions. This is not enough because, like everyone has said, agriculture is the backbone of our economy. And what we are giving back to agriculture is not in the same currency as what agriculture is giving to the nation. Robert, I want to bring you into the conversation, and, and this really speaks to insight number eight, uh, the conversation that's going on. Many people pay their taxes hoping that government delivers a service at the end of the day, and small enterprises are telling you they don't feel that service delivery. They don't feel like government capital gets to them. Um, is it a problem of the design of the policy? Is it a problem of the, the SMEs and, and the way they run their, their businesses? Where is the problem? Why isn't there that service delivery? Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's a much faceted question. And whenever I, I get to hear that question, I pity URA because they are the ones who bear the, the burden of explaining service delivery. And, and my observation is that uh, until we recognize that tax policy and administration is not for the Uganda Revenue Authority, mm -hmm. it is a whole of government approach. That's why when you saw perceptions, when you ask people, normal people, they will tell you taxpayers' money. Taxpayers' money. You are a, in, in when, this, this was very intriguing, I said. There's a graph that showed some people, when you ask them what you are does, and they say they construct roads. <laughs> yeah, me, I don't take this for granted, by the way. And you know what does that, does that mean? The last four years, you are a, invested a lot in branding, billboards showing, because of you, this hospital, uh, children can access medical service. Because of you, our infrastructure is developing. So for, from their part, in terms of tax, and I want to applaud you, tax education, from their part, they want to show the citizens that their tax money is working. But I don't know how much other agencies in government are supporting URA as well in that capacity. See, taxation should not be seen as a function of revenue administration alone. The motivation and the intervention that uh, my brother is from the Ministry of Finance talking about uh, is, is of what? Is of doing business. Is an issue of bringing together government agencies to facilitate business. In Rwanda, for instance, it does not stop a traffic officer to stop a truck loaded with goods and ask them if they have receipt. A traffic officer. Do you, did you pay for these goods? Where are you coming from? He's not a revenue administrator. So this is what I'm saying. How do we collaborate with other agencies so that URA is not overburdened? Our economy is a hand-to-mouth economy. If URA does not collect today, civil servants won't eat. But whenever they get challenges, it is the URA service delivery, URA collection, URA. I mean, where is the rest of the government? If you ask in private, in anonymity, a URA domestic access office or customs officer, how he feels when he sees billions of shillings being swindled by a public official or a politician, they would rather also collect for themselves. So the example should, it, the effort should be in the entire government, should not be a URA effort. So we will say, you've stolen 60 billion, which I collected. I was in the door drums collecting for the citizens. You took it away. How do you expect me to be motivated? So before even you think of the motivation of the business people, <laughs> let's think about the URA themselves. How are the officers inside there? In fact, I wanted to ask uh, my brother here from the URA uh, that even when you do customer satisfaction surveys using people like Faweza and the rest, it is also good to do internal evaluations of the satisfaction levels of your own staff, especially those who are in operations. It matters a lot in terms of revenue what? collection. Take an example, this financial year loan, no new taxes, but they are expected to hit target. That means they have to improve their administrative efficiency. So when they come to your door and close, like my brother shared in Bugabula, in his area, it's because of the pressure of government wanting to collect money without necessarily investing in expanding the tax base or creating economic activity, which is not URA's role alone. I thank you. 
All right, I, I want, of course, to pack that now with the, the man from URA. Um, and, and really the, the question to you is simple around tax education. Um, there's a lot of education that URA does externally. Um, are you learning something uh, from the businesses, from SMEs? Um, if I could speak for myself, I also run a couple of businesses and um, the last thing I want is a URA text message or an email. And most of the times that you engage with URA officers over email contesting a, a tax assessment, the same comes back next year. Do you guys learn from what SMEs are telling you about your assessment and do you improve efficiency around them? Uh, thank you, Raymond. Uh, in your AI serve in a capacity and office uh, that deals with communication, awareness, and client experience. We are the function that engages on daily with, uh, with the taxpayer uh, through our public awareness, through public relations, through tax awareness, through the quality of service, and we gauge it from within and out. And the challenges or the bad experience that anyone may have in dealing with a tax fund, that alone is uh, an impediment to their compliance, if there is any, it's an impediment. Just imagine if someone was intent to pay 10 million today and the URA service is off, what are the chances that they will pay the same 10 million tomorrow? Okay, so the quality of service, the level of awareness, it's very, very important and it would be wrong for us to assume that people will be compliant if we do not inform them, if we do not engage them and assist them. To the, because by itself, naturally, tax is not an easy subject. It's not like you just actually said, you do not want to receive that text. So we have to make it easy. We have to make it, uh, they have to know, we have to make them aware and what have we learned? You, you ask that question. Uh, Around 2018, we were, because uh, by that time we didn't have COVID, Uganda Revenue Authority was on a quarterly uh, arrangement conducting business forums with business communities to pick their mind. And in one of those engagements, a lady stood up and she put up her notebook like this and she swung it. Actually, we were in Africana, just across. She put it in the air and said, as long as I don't know how to keep my records, do not expect me to pay taxes. Record keeping, because it is the, it's the starting point. So what are we learning? What we are learning is we need to assist. A colleague here just shared that we need to build the tax base, not to count on what, who is on the register, but you need to participate in creating the tax base. And that is why the mandate of URA, if you have monitored, uh, like on the flanks of the customs department, we are moving from being collectors into facilitators of business. How fast do goods move between Malaba to Jinja to, uh, to the next border post, wherever they are destined? I don't know. But that is where we are changing our direction, facilitation that someone who would only have to bring in maybe 10 containers is able to bring in 15, okay? That is where we are moving. And what we coined at the time was the development of a financial literacy program. We realized the mandate of financial literacy is not in URA, it sits with Bank of Uganda. So we engage Bank of Uganda because they are in charge of that. They are aware of the financial dynamics, the business dynamics that anyone operating in this ecosystem ought to know. When we engage, they train the, the tax education staff of URA in, and they have a curriculum that touches around eight elements. One, personal financial management. How we manage our business. I've interacted with many business persons. You get to them, and actually because you're the government, they see, they will pour out everything. Because you're the, you're the government, they see. They will pour out about the, the challenges they are having with bank, the, the challenges they are having maybe with insurance, the challenges we are having with investment decisions that have not worked, and there is a government facility they have hoped would help them, but it has not assisted, 
Okay, so they have a curriculum, and we have worked with Bank of Uganda it, by uh, around 2018, towards COVID. We developed the financial literacy strategy. I don't know how many people in this room know that Uganda has a financial literacy strategy. Okay, we developed, and under each of the core elements, the core messages of this financial literacy strategy, we sat in components of tax, personal financial management savings, managing records, tax itself, investments, insurance to safeguard that investment, planning for old age, your choice of financial service providers. I don't know, but there are banks here where it is better for you to go and borrow for agriculture, and it's not good if you're going into manufacturing. Okay, the choices that we make. So we have developed that and aligned our awareness and information and services to support. There are lessons that we are learning. And I think the improvement that we have seen in the attitude of uh, the public towards taxation, they are not by mistake. There has been an effort. But the challenge is in functions like communication and awareness, it is like school fees and tuition for your child. You will pay for 16, 20 years only for you to see, to find the yield after that time. So you do not see immediate impact. You will need scientific me methods like this to keep you or to help you keep track on the change in behavior. And that is why we are very happy with this study because it is giving us that independent opinion on the progress that we are making and areas where we are not making progress and so this is an opportunity for us to find remedies. I <laughs> All right, thank you. I, I want to come to Honorable Henry and Isaac uh, because I know when you talk about the taxes not being fair, insight number 12, um, we normally blame URA, but those taxes are designed by Isaac's department, passed by Honorable um, Henry's uh, parliament. Um, this insight here about tax rates not being fair, is, do you think it's a fair assessment of of the work that's being done by government to collect taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Yeah. Taxes not being fair or being fair, much as we pass these laws, but at times when you people are there, you see our arguments and how we really feel some of these things should be revised. Colleagues, like it or not, Uganda is just a developing country. And we can only grow based on the SMEs. We are not yet in the other high level, but we have slightly moved from the lowest level. Now, if we have to grow using the sector of SMEs, we must be mindful of how we levy taxes and how we handle them. One, we at times have issues. You levy a regressive tax, that will have the small business clause, and at the end of the day, you are saying you want to increase tax base. Not knowing that if there was a way you would either subsidize or help that business survive for a year, so that in the next one year it can take off and be in a position to begin paying taxes and employ some people that you can even tax using payers you earn so that you widen the tax base. But we at times look at something, we fail to be outward looking and we, we behave like uh, people that are inward looking because you have a target of a given quota to collect money, so you must go and squeeze some people and make sure money is squeezed, is got from there. Yet if as government, because uh, Raymond and colleagues, like it or not, we can't underrate the effect of COVID-19 now. COVID-19 really destroyed most of the businesses. Now, as government, we are supposed to sit and analyze and say, most of the businesses closed. Why did the businesses close? What can we do as government? What can we forego now so that we see them? Much as we didn't increase taxes, but we, ha we had a way of even reducing them so that we support, if we can't subsidize a small business, let us give it space to take off on its own so that as it takes off, we are sure in the next one or two years, we shall have the capacity 
to collect money or tax from that business so that we can pay back what we lost. Uh, my colleague was talking about uh, African Development, uh, Uganda Development Bank. Personally, maybe Jenny will help. As, uh, as, uh, as an MP, I have issues. Raymond, if we take a sample, these are people from middle class. Who of these can tell us one person who has accessed money from Uganda Development Bank? This one's in the room. They are not from Bugabula, where they come from. They are from Kampala. Who can put up your hand and say, I have got this one who has accessed money from Uganda Development Bank? But this is a bank where we normally put money every year. And we are saying it's money to be accessed by SMEs, by growing people, developing people to do this and the other. But if you go in another meeting of another class, you'll find that 70% of people who will be sitting in that meeting have accessed that money. That money does it to go to help the small person to grow. It's money hidden in there for some other people to use. You get it? Yet if we help to the SMEs, this is the only sector that would help. The facilities, some of these facilities are there, but who are the people that are supporting and accessing them? When we wake up and say we want now to promote we develop, uh, the PDM, the development model, the parish development model, if the effort that we have put in developing the parish development model was the effort we put in some of these sectors that can grow, because you pick money, take to my village in Kamuli, people are sleeping hungry, children are not going to school, for you have put a law that they must access that money from that village and use. They use it for what? You have left the person who has the idea of a business, who can grow a business, who wants to be helped in a smaller way to start off so that he can help in adding to the tax base, even gaining the tax capacity to be in position to be assessed tax and pay and employing others, you are saying, no, let me take this money to Bugavula, give these people, because it's a policy, it's a program, and they must use it. My people who are sleeping hungry, who have failed to have children go to school, who have borrowed the money from small, small banks, but they have failed to pay those loans, you are giving them this money to develop a parish development model program. How? Let us make a research as a government. That is why, Raymond, you heard me from my beginning, that if this was a serious government, we would take advantage of some of this research and data, if it was a serious government. But we don't do research, we don't collect data, we don't put data into practice, we just wake up one morning and say this, one morning you want to implement this, as if it came by a dream, it can't work. We must only be realistic. If we want to grow this country, if we want to develop this country, we must invest in research so that by the time we bring a program, by the time we begin something, now we have not increased the taxes, but the taxes, little money we are collecting from taxes is going to parish development model, which will collapse in the next one year. And we shall have lost that money. We don't learn from history. You have brought me yoga, it has collapsed. You, we, in my constituency, I take a constituency that has a three zero three zones. There is no single youth I can show you who has prospered because of the youth livelihood. Is not there. So we have not taken research. We have not done what we are supposed to do. But we shall bring the laws. The policies, they will come to parliament. We shall pass them because it's my duty to pass laws. What else can I do? Uh, Isaac is not amused um, at the description of his government. But, but Isaac, if you can respond to that, but also to, to another question, really. Um, I know that the tax policy department does research at the Ministry of Finance. I also know that your minister sits on the, the monetary policy committee at the Bank of Uganda. So really, there's a lot of research that goes into the work that you guys do. Um, what's the space for independent research like this one that Wes has done, that Wes has done, to make it into the policy formulation process? Thank you, Raymond. Uh, uh, and thank you, Honorable. 
The new government has three arms from what I studied from primary school. The executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. I think the honorable should do us justice by telling us which particular arm is not serious. But as far as I know from the executive, we are very serious. But then also, um, I had, of course, I take the feedback of um, the previous speakers, particularly in the way the, these government programs have been received. And indeed, we, the, 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 the rationale of us being here is to take the perception of people on what government is doing uh, to help us form basis for improvement going forward. So I won't drill so much into the issues of um, these um, yoga programs, UDB, and so on and so forth, because there are autonomous bodies which are implementing these, and I think we would answer these questions better. But in terms of the qu question you've just posed to me, uh, how receptive, for example, this research is at the ministry, First and foremost, this research has been done jointly with Uganda Revenue Authority. Uganda Revenue Authority is part of government. So it shows you that the research has already been received by government. But beyond that, um, we at the ministry designed what we call a domestic revenue mobilization strategy. This is a cornerstone for government revenue generation efforts for now and in the medium term. So the process of development of this strategy, first and foremost, it involved research. This research was done internally and externally. We relied so much on development partners, civil society organizations like Tax Justice Alliance, academia, universities, economic policy research center, private tax practitioners, and so on and so forth, to bring together uh, research expertise to help us formulate a strategy to take us forward. Now, that shows you the extent to which the ministry is receptive to external research. The other issue is that one of the things that were identified in the research that we did was that there seemed to be a bit of um, lack of transparency and stakeholder participation in the design of both our policies and administrative reforms. So the key recommendation um, that we put in that strategy was to enhance our stakeholder consultation processes. On the side of tax policy design, every October, we write to all interested stakeholders to come and give the ministry their views on how the tax policy is designed and how they, th they think it should be reformed in the next financial year and going forward. So we engage in debate with whoever is interested. And then when these proposals are generated and they have been approved by cabinet, they are, they are, uh, they are submitted to parliament through tax bills. And I know that parliament also has a framework for stakeholder engagement. It normally makes announcements to everyone who might have an interest in any of the bills before parliament to come and give their feedback. I think I'm correct when I say. So after that, the bill is debated further on the floor of parliament. So. Government as a whole, including the legislature, is very open to stakeholder engagement and open to external research, and it is normally received happily. Thank you. 
All right, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to allow our audience to ask questions, but uh, maybe if I could pose a question to, to Jen Pakito um, directly. Um, there's an insight here around um, citizens feeling that taxes are unfair. Um, and part of that sentiment, uh, I presume, is, is just the way that parliament in itself handles um, government. You handle them with kid gloves around how they use our taxes. Um, as a committee, vice committee chair of finance, um, have you had instances where um, you engage government more closely on how they use our taxes? Um, have you had instances where you discuss um, finances proposals and say, you know, this, this, this won't cut it? Do we have space for, for something like that? Raymond, if it were in, mm. your, in your, I would say Jane comes to take this seat. She's a and uh, I would be very comfortable so that she even takes on the, the reactions from the you, you, you want to run away from no, the questions, but it, it's I fine. Request, I request. It's fine. I, if she's comfortable with it, it it's fine. Thank you, Raymond, and the audience here. I first must apologize for coming late. We had an engagement with the Prime Minister this morning. Actually, it didn't end. It has been adjourned until midday. And I was in touch with Mr. Chimonges. I'm sorry for coming late. Uh, could you say, state the question again? The, the question is, how hard are you on government um, to make sure that they account for almost every penny of taxes that is given to them? Um, so that citizens get the feeling that their taxes is doing something. Uh, thank you, Raymond. How hard are we as a committee or as parliament? Um, one, we have our mandate as Committee of Finance in that we have to process the budgets for the Minister of Finance and also the different agencies under Minister of Finance. During the budget process, we, had, we ask the hard questions, that is one. And then two, we also have to process the, the tax bills. And we do ask the hard questions. We engage stakeholders and with a view that we come to a common position that does not hurt the Ugandan citizens so much or business community in our economy. But also, as part of our oversight role, we have the mandate to, you know, engage, for instance, with URA. I'll, 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 I'll give you a situation where last, last financial year, we visited all the, not all, but uh, quite a number of um, the customs uh, border posts to really see for ourselves the challenges that URA may be uh, having in relation to tax administration so that as a committee, we are well informed and try our best to support URA as much as possible in trying to strengthen them in terms of um, the funding, in terms of um, maybe policies that may, may, not, may not be very, very conducive for them in collecting taxes and um, other mandates that they, are, they, 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 are, they, they have to undertake. So, but of course, as parliament also, it's not only the Committee of Finance that does this. The House as a whole, these tax bills are taken to, on the floor and debated. Sometimes you've, you've seen, for instance, these this current um, tax bills. Nearly all our proposals as a committee was turned down. So it is not just the Committee of Finance, but the entire House to really um, see the, 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 our observations and recommendations and either go with us or go with the proposal that comes from, 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 from finance. But we also have the accountability committees that are responsible to see to it that every penny collected um, by URA is put to good use so that the, the end person feels, yes, it is fair for me to pay tax because I will benefit by having, for instance, when we visited the border post, we, 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 we realized that, yes, whereas the businesses, it is not just about taxation. They're not just hurt by the high, the high rates of taxes or the high cost of borrowing, but you find 
somebody has a problem in transporting the goods, we have a problem of the auxiliaries of trade are not that adequate in this economy. The, the insurance, the, the transport system is still putting a back where you should have received goods in Kampala within a few days. Our railway systems are not yet up, upbeat. The, the, the roads are not that good. So it's not, the cost of doing business is not just about the cost of borrowing and the high tax rates. But I think we need to do more as government to, to, to really work on the, the different modes of transport to ease business, doing business in this country. All right, uh, thank you so much. I'm going to ask the audience, uh, if you have questions, just put up your hand, um, tell us your name and who you're directing the question to. I think we'll start with the gentleman at the back. Um, do I have someone to move the microphone around? Okay. We'll start with the gentleman at the back and come at the front. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andrew Bessie. I am a citizen of this republic from a place called Rujumbra. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this very good workshop. It's been very insightful, so I thank you very much. Now, just a few observations. Um, among my people, they were horror. We have a saying, Simply, the hunter and his dog face the same burden, they face the same risk. I have listened to the gentleman and the lady at the high table. I've also listened to the presenters, but I think there's something we are not connecting, and it is this. In 2011, okay, a similar survey that almost similar to what has been carried out found that the chief, chief impediment to entrepreneurship in Uganda was the cost of finance. In 2016, a similar survey found the same result. We are now in 2022, and it is the same result. At the time, there was a gentleman in URA who is now in UCC. Uh, not in U not, 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 not UCC. There was a gentleman in URA, I don't know where he is now, but he left, okay? And he was seated where you are seated. And I asked him a question. I said, there's a person I know who has a building, a commercial building in town, okay? Today, URA will wake up. They will never tell you the formula they have used to assess the tax that they are demanding of him. But they will wake up, and they will put something they call an agency notice. So the man will go to URA and speak and speak and bargain and bargain. And they will say, OK, you pay this, and we open. Meanwhile, make plans to bring our money. So he has just stepped out of that. Then KCCA will come, OK? And they will say, we estimate that over the last five years, you have dodged this amount of tax. And the man will say, I've never made this money. And KCCA will insist. Then an officer will come and say, you come to our office, and we discuss. So the problem seems to be, one, we are not addressing the cost of money. But two, we seem to be paying the same tax to different entities over and over again. Now you know what is being done to make this process seamless. And then, secondly, the Honorable Chualabi has run away. He keeps talking about government, if government was serious. But then you ask yourself. Recently, the Minister of Finance told us our economy was <laughs> OK? Remember that statement? Then he came back and said, we are suffering with imported inflation because of what the president calls Ukraine, right? But the same parliament goes ahead and blows over 1.2 billion to buy two luxury cars for their speakers. And yet the said speakers are driving already luxurious cars. So isn't the problem really not the government, but the part of the government, which is the legislature? Thank you. All right. Um, the gentleman, the, oh, first here, and then we'll go in that direction. Here at the front? Yeah. Right here, uh, gentleman in a mask. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Brian Serunjoji. I work for the Economic Policy Research Center based at Makere. And the uh, results here 
for this study are very interesting. Uh, the Economic Policy Research Center was recently involved in assessing the informal sector of Uganda, and some of the results here kind of speak to what we saw. Nonetheless, I have a few comments that I want to talk about. First, um, on the research itself, it would have been very interesting for this uh, survey to ask more about formalization, business registration, whether businesses are registered and not registered, what are some of the imp impediments. This is in line with uh, assessing the tax environment for the benefit of URA. And also to kind of assess some of the previous interventions like TREP, how, they, how did this work? Have we learned anything from these uh, for the benefit of URA and how they, they could change? But also, the study uh, brings up uh, interesting findings. Uh, charging of teens, we also saw this. Now, charging of teens, if you read, according to the URA, this is supposed to be free. But uh, if people are saying, 38% are saying, teens are charged an average of 43,000, it points to hidden costs that uh, taxpayers are finding. Probably uh, the mode of getting these teens is kind of not friendly for our illiterate taxpayers. And so they have to incur an extra cost to either pay the URA to assist them, which, which this study rightly points out. And how can we make sure that people can easily get their teens without having to uh, uh, pay these hidden costs? Um, the other is on uh, uh, the finding on, 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 on figure 19, which, which shows that uh, why do you think people avoid taxes? People feel tax rates on earnings are too high perception, and this points to awareness. Do people know that, because most of these people that you're interviewing are micro-enterprises, and I, I believe, according to the URA, they, they, they are liable to a presumptive tax regime. Do they know there's a presumptive tax? And how do, you, do they come to know this? Uh, the other one is on figure 14, um, and people, 95% are saying they've never had a contact with the URA. We've, we've found out this thing in the assessment of the informality study, but also, I know URA cannot be everywhere, and under the trip arrangement, they've been mainly at the urban centers. But we found out that at the local council levels, some of these local council people have even books. So I think URA can liaise with some of these lower, you know, local government, because they know, and people trust them. They feel URA is kind of, uh, they, they fear it, in quotes, so they feel, so there has to be a way of 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 of, of liaising with these people that know uh, these taxpayers. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I think we'll take just two more questions at the back. Him and the gentleman at the back. Thank you, Raymond. Good morning. My name is Dennis Pato. Uh, the question I'm about to ask, uh, I would like the person who is representing SMEs to help us understand a bit more, but also to put my mother, Jen Pachuto to the task to explain a bit uh, more on the role on, of government in this, in the reality of uh, my inquiry. The report, the parting shot from the report was that the key business challenge is access to capital. I think in this room, we are being a bit disingenuous to the practical reality of the last mile citizen. Um, like the gentleman at the back there mentioned, so many studies have been made coming to the same conclusion, lack of access to capital. But government insists, and we have seen it, that so many efforts have been made to make capital accessible, especially to youth in this country, which is the cons that, that I represent in my job. But you will find that time and again, Whatever ventures, whatever initiatives that young people come up with will fail. They are not failing because they were not given money. They are failing partly because there was no feasibility study done uh, by government or whatever entity is advancing these efforts towards supporting the youth. We have done our own study and we interact with these realities every day in the face of the reality of young people in the country. Young people are excited about money. 
And when you make money available to them, they will not say no. But time and again, you will find that they are not prepared for the very capital you are extending to them. I would like, on the part of government, my mother, Jen Pacheto, and she will tell you why I'm calling her that, to elaborate a bit more uh, how do we bridge the gap between the findings of this report versus government effort and the practical reality, which in my view is the lack of preparedness on the part of youth in this country to actually receive the capital that the government has been advancing through the various ventures. Uh, but if our colleague from uh, SMAs could also chip in and help us sort of build that nexus between the parting statement in this report and this particular question. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, just one last question at the back. Um. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Marie. And uh, actually, uh, this one goes to uh, tax awareness uh, URA. Actually, it's just a clarification. And when Marie was trying to highlight she was saying that uh, you are able to clarify. And one of the issues, one is on the, it is 10, yes, uh, an official levy. To me, I think there are a number of people who are here who don't understand an official levy. And uh, is NSSF a tax or a levy, of which you haven't clarified that. And I think members can take it as a tax, which is not. But also even local excise duty, which is, I think, supposed to be Excise Duty Act controlling it. And to me, I think you should give a light on that. And uh, in one way or the other, I concur with Suna what was proposing. And from my perspective, is around uh, supporting URA in one way or the other. And this one, I was of the view that I can propose at least, it is expensive, but in one way or the other for the people to realize uh, the significance of tax is URA at least. Uh, to uh, there was a time when you were trying to uh, give uh, uh, learning behind the exercise books about taxes. Can we at least print out at least five and being given to the best five performers per class and those books should be having at least simple information, explaining simple uh, 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 tax related aspects that each and every person can understand because in one way or the other, if a person is uh, a best performer and someone can say Julius received books even containing information from URA, it entices that person, but also even the parents who are giving uh, uh, school fees to the, to, the, to the kids. So to me, I think you should also, among the colleagues who are here, the media, to understand is NSSF a tax, is um, the, non, the unofficial taxes. To me, I think you are talking about the non-tax revenues. To, on my side, I can understand, but someone who doesn't understand can say, that is, what is this one? So to me, in, in, in the perspective of awareness, we can talk about that one. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much. I, I think we'll just come back to our panel here and try and uh, wrap it up. We'll, we'll start with Isaac uh, and all the way down to, to Michael. Um, so Isaac, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for your feedback. I think I want to comment on uh, two issues as we conclude. Number one is the unfairness of our tax system. I think for me, when someone mentions unfairness, it is unfair compared to what? what is the alternative that they are comparing with to, to conclude that the system is unfair. I think for me the most important thing is for government indeed to enhance its uh, fiscal social contract. Um, I've just heard a voice, someone mentioned that how can you be uh, in this current period there is high inflation and so on and so forth. And then you purchase two new luxury vehicles for government officials. Well, they are entitled to transport, but maybe the timing. But 
most importantly is that as a whole, we need to take on efforts um, aimed at improving service delivery because it is, it is through which people uh, get returns from the investment they are putting in government. Unfortunately, again, um, tax policy dictates that when you pay, you don't necessarily receive a direct benefit. You know, it's, it's, it, when you pay, the money is used to provide a, a public benefit, not an individual benefit. But it's important that in our um, quest to provide these public benefits, we ensure that there is value for money so that those who are paying can get encouraged to continue paying. Now, there is an issue that has been raised on uh, multiple tax rates. I understand it, and I blame it on uh, government. You know, the central government imposes tax laws constitutionally, I think under Article 152, subsection I, I think. And they are imposed by an act of parliament. But also the law, uh, the local government act, gives local government powers to impose laws and collect some fees. So on one end, the Ministry of Finance uh, has imposed taxes, and on the other end, ministry, uh, the local governments are imposing certain uh, taxes. Some of them, you'll find, they are targeting the same base. Okay? So you find there is that uncoordinated troop movement from government, and then you find some tax rates overlap others. I think this puts fatigue on, um, on taxpayers and somehow discourages voluntary compliance. Now, in addition to those, there are also other fiscal charges that government imposes um, for purposes of regulatory functions. Um, many ministries, departments, and agencies which are, which are charged with some regulatory functions charge certain fees as they perform those functions. But it is the same government. All these are fiscal charges that come to the Treasury. So it is very important that um, as a government, and this is feedback which I'm taking back, that we sit down, we take stock of all these charges. Maybe we will find that there are some that can be merged. We will find that there are some that are no longer relevant. Or there will be even some that are very important that we can consider increasing, either for the purpose of um, facilitating regulation and formalization, or for the purposes of enhancing compliance. So with that, uh, I thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Raymond. Um, I'll just co make a brief, brief comment, and I'm happy that the, the uh, official from Minister of Finance recognizes the need to take stock of the different charges. As, as he has explained, I don't want to dwell into that so much. As a committee, we shall be waiting for that. And uh, that is also something that I'm taking back to the committee that, we, 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 that needs to be addressed. Um, on the luxurious cars, uh, colleagues, Every year, government of Uganda makes budgets. And different entities come with their priority needs, and it is budgeted and approved. If this has been approved, I think it is, it, it, it could be on, it's high-ended, but I think it is something that is not stolen, it is approved, and the, the two officials, that is where the, the kind of cars that are supposed to drive. Of course, the timing is not very good, but uh, we take note of that. It is, uh, but I think that the bigger picture should be, as a country, we should look at holistically how we can cut down costs of doing business in this country. The, the expenditure, government expenditure, 
right now, I think government is looking at rationalization of um, different ag agencies, merging them. I think also we should, we should start looking at um, areas of, you know, certain government spending. Th that, that's what I can, the brief comment I can give. Um, on the issues of how can, uh, this is mainly for URA, but I had a comment on getting teams. I, I, yes, we have a number of people who are doing business. They are not that literate. But really, if your business is growing and you really see, you see a, a lot of potential in your business, but you are not literate, wouldn't it be prudent that you, you hire the, the right people to help you in running and management of your business? The, I don't see how teams should be a very big, a big problem, especially for those businesses that are growing and and I have potential to even grow more. Um, access to capital, my son Dennis was like, how do we bridge the gap between government efforts and the unpreparedness by the recipients of these funds? And I want to thank Dennis by recognizing the fact that government has made several efforts to try and help pull our people out of poverty. But the challenge so far is not so much of how much capital is, uh, is, is not there, has not been put out there. But the, the, the unpreparedness of people to receive this money. And I want to take, I want not to talk just about the youth. We've talked about the funds in UEDB. You know, people complain the, the, the criteria is, is, is too much, but nobody tells you what is exactly so difficult for you to achieve in order to access these funds. Because like I've said before, if you are running your business prudently and professionally, some of those things over the years, the same people will not be complaining. I think it is high time as Ugandans, we do businesses a little bit more professional. We prepare ourselves. We don't have to jump start everything. If you've prepared yourself and allowed yourself to grow over time, I believe that as you grow, you're able to bridge these gaps. But for the government different fundings, for sure, there's usually pre unpreparedness. There's been a lot of unpreparedness. Y money, money should be demanded. Money should not just be supplied. If, if you go to my village in Wadelai, for instance, and you just come and tell youth, form yourself in a group, money is coming. Nobody is going to refuse it. But I think if you prepared them and you found people who are ready If, you, if we organized our youth in a way that right from childhood, we groom these children to learn to accept to work, I think the problem we have now emanates from how we are parenting our children. If you are, if you are the Mukwano of today, you, you don't involve your children in doing some of the businesses, or you're a farm, you're, you're a sugarcane uh, grower. You are not involving your children to, to, grow, to be part of that business. I can assure you, tomorrow they are not, however much money you leave them with, they may not be able to cope up with that business. They may not even be interested because after all, what they used to get was just money put to them to use. So I think it, it, is, it is something much, we need more fundamental you know, moves to, to, to see how to inculcate the spirit of working and giving money to people who are ready to work, not just idolers who, who, whom you just say, you know, you know, you have to get out of poverty. The person should have been oriented that I need to work hard to get out of poverty. Patrick knows where the village I come from, but I think I've worked for it to be where I am now. People should be, you know, trained, groomed right from childhood to work. The, this need of saying, form yourself into a circle, so what? People, if you tell them, we gave them yoga. Some, I have funds lying idle in Pakwach, in the banks. Boda Boda who earn money every day have not been able to access their 30 million. So it, is, it, it all points to the unpreparedness. But all the, not only unpreparedness, there is no need to supply money to people who don't need it. Uh, thank you so much. I want to thank uh, Dennis Pato for the question. And uh, you requested that I uh, give our perspective as SMEs on how this gap, uh, the, the, the gap can be bridged. Uh, it's true, and uh, it has also been alluded, uh, sorry, uh, reflected in this uh, document, 
that SMEs, that capital access to capital remains uh, the biggest challenge to most of the SMEs. And uh, I want to thank government, of course. It has done its part, although <laughs> the efforts are not good enough. But government, of course, has done its part in coming up with different interventions to ensure that uh, several women-led SMEs, youth-led SMEs, circles, name it, uh, access some kind of support and uh, uh, funds to scale up. But of course, the challenge, as highlighted by, by Pato, is uh, that even those that have received this money or these kind of facilities are failing to, to scale up. Some of the business have, businesses have even collapsed. And I want to believe that this is partly because the culture of how people start up businesses here yeah, needs to be uh, checked. Because you find if the moment somebody gets money, they don't go into orientation, they don't go into any kind of training on how to do a business, they just go straight into starting up a business. And some of the businesses don't even see their first birthday because of that. So in a way of bridging this gap, uh, we are encouraging both government and the private sector to come up with what we call incubation centers or business uh, uh, SME academies. For us as the Federation of SMEs, we have started up uh, this kind of program for SMEs, those who want to start up businesses. It's not all about getting the money and open a shop the next day. First get the orientation, know how to handle the business, how do you manage your business, how do you survive uh, challenges, how do you go about the entire business environment. So this is one of uh, the things that I believe honorable uh, we should interest ourselves in both as government and the private uh, stakeholders to ensure that especially the youth, the, those in the informal businesses, they don't know what to do. But because he has a million shillings and he wants to earn, he will start up a business and it will collapse. So uh, that's one of the issues that I believe should be taken up uh, importantly, and I believe once we have uh, uh, put efforts around that, we shall see most of the businesses now starting to survive. Thank you so much. Raymond, thank you, and thanks, colleagues, uh, fellow panelists. I think I have a Katale Keka in Uganda, and the, hearing the figures quoted from the Ministry of Finance regarding the target for the Revenue Authority, about 25.6 trillion. Yeah. And the, what we forgot to mention is that uh, is now about every 30 of the 100 shillings these people will be collecting will be going to debt servicing. So I thought there would be some comments on, uh, on debt, our appetite for borrowing. I think government need to check it. Uh, I know we need to invest in prioritized investments and the rest of our appetite for borrowing is, is not on a law. I know everywhere it's, it's happening, but if whatever you're collecting, 30% of it goes into servicing the debt, we are in even the person who was born yesterday is indebted. We, we need to check that one as, as government and that's not only a question of tax policy, it's a question of the entire government. I, I also wish to challenge um, the tax policy department in collaboration with the URA to rethink about the impact of tax rates on, on compliance. This, this research shows us that actually if you, if service delivery is good and other cooperant factors that support business are in place, taxpayers will not necessarily be bothered by the tax rates. So let's think about research around that area and which recommendations we can, we can make. Uh, I'm happy that there are efforts by government to consolidate all what we call fiscal consolidation, reducing expenditure and repurposing the budget. That's a very good effort and commendable one. However, we should be mindful that we should not over constrain service delivery in the name of consolidating budget. I'm aware of uh, for the last two quarters, uh, the releases, the, the quarterly releases have been reducing. Government is broke. That's what they have been said. So you may wish to consolidate the budget and repurpose it, but let's not do it to the detriment of service delivery so that someone is completely constrained to deliver a service. We have seen that service delivery is very critical. So, and uh, I was happy, uh, Madam, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, there was at least a moratorium on, on uh, 
uh, stopping the creation of new political constituencies. I think that was a very good move. Uh, I, I don't think there will be new parish, parishes evolved because of the parish development model. I, ho I, I hope some will not be created to, to partake of the, of, the, uh, of the money that has been extended to parish development. I hope that Montreal is respected. No new uh, political constituencies are created in the name of trying to benefit from the parish development model. For the Uganda Revenue Authority, I think the idea of uh, tax education and awareness is a continuous process. And then our population is, is as good as how much they can. There is a lot of evidence in research showing the positive correlation between uh, tax morale and tax awareness and education. We need these figures they are presenting in terms of awareness to be uh, improved. What, what is your, what does it even do? And the rest, I thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Michael? Uh, thank you, Raymond, and thank you, everyone. I had uh, some areas, uh, especially in uh, integrity. Uh, integrity was one of the capacity development areas that were highlighted in the DRMS, the Domestic Revenue Mobilization Strategy, because without it, you don't have a trusted tax administration to which people comfortably and confidently pay. So we have restructured the institution okay, and set up functions that are dedicated to seeing that uh, uh, there is integrity on both ends, the URA staff and even on the uh, taxpayer side, that is one on the people. Uh, within our processes, we are also seeing that uh, there is a review of the entire institutional process line because this is where we see the service and this is where we find instances of uh, people uh, finding themselves having to pay for TIN. Now, in regard to TIN, remember TIN is one of the most highly used processes in the URA, the taxpayer registration process, the return filing and declaration process, and the payment process. Uh, these are very, very highly used. And any, uh, if they are hard in any way, if they are complex in, in any way, they create that avenue. So we are trying to make these processes, even when they are automated, we are making them more simplified. Right now, you can apply for a tax identification number, either as a company or as an individual without visiting URA on your phone. If you have a business registration number or a certificate of incorporation, you can get an instant tax identification number on your phone right now within five minutes. And we are doing all these advancements to help us sort this problem because we are alive to it. We are alive to it and we are making all efforts possible to address them. Now, we got an issue on uh, the way forward. When the presentation was being made, on the research findings, the main question was, how are we going forward? Uganda has an estimated 7 million productive population, people who would ideally be on the tax register. When you look at our numbers again, 50% of our people are in informal activity. And so we need to, to, to in a way, enable them to uh, uh, to get into within the tax bracket. Now, the main question that we ask, and the question that has been asked is, where does the informal sector come from? Where does the informal sector come from? Because we need to arrest the problem before it, it morphs into a larger problem. And one of the strategic interventions that we are making is to arrest it through the education system. Because we have a very, very big youth population. Now, these are in the education system. So we have already implemented a curriculum program for secondary schools. And one of the main aims at all level, the first, uh, the first uh, students to sit for this uh, uh, UCE exams are going to be 2023, okay? But we want it that by the time, even if this child or student leaves school at senior four, they know what they have to do with their municipal government, with the URA, and with all the registration authorities and uh, regulators. At least that's key. And the same for A-level, and right now at Uganda Revenue Authority, for the past, this is the fifth week, we are sitting with the National Curriculum Development Center, like we did for the secondary schools. We are also doing the same for the B2B, the business, vocational, and technical institutions. 
We are developing a curriculum that equips them because this is where the guys who run saloons, restaurants, garages, who are actually practiced in the informal sector are seated. So we are trying to address the informal sector from where it begins, engage them and enable them to be able to address and understand the tax issues uh, that will uh, enable them to, uh, to, to be compliant uh, when they turn into business operators. So we are having those, uh, those interventions, among others, that I may not be able to address in this forum to attend to the issue. Mm -hmm. All right, you. thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a round of applause for our panel. You've done such an amazing job um, speaking to us. I think I will invite Violet <laughs> to give us our closing remarks. Um, oh, okay. I need to hand over power peacefully to who gave it to me. So I've handed over now. Up a big one. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, we have come very close to the end of this uh, event. It's been full of learning, insights, and all that. I saw smiles running around, and I also saw so many questions running. I hope our citizens will also have questions and answers as we have them. So um, as we close, I would like first to uh, thank and recognize the Tax Justice um, Alliance and uh, URA once again, and the Minister of Finance and the Federation of SMEs and the Parliament of Uganda for making it uh, to this event. And uh, I'm inviting someone who is going to close this. And when he's done, I will not mention any word. My M your MC, I've been Alan Asinguza. I work with Tuaweza. And allow me now to invite Mr. Robert Wamara, who is the manager of corporate uh, affairs at uh, URA, to give us closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, the Honorable Members of Parliament, the representative of the Minister of Finance, our bosses, Waweza Uganda, the researchers in the room, the URA team, our friends, the media, distinguished guests. You know, I used to be a journalist before, so using my voice is, is part of the deal. My name is Robert Wamala Lumanyika. I work as the manager for public and corporate affairs at the Uganda Revenue Authority. It is with a great pleasure that I officiate at the closure of this dissemination workshop. I bring with me greetings from the URA, the Commissioner General, senior management and the staff of the authority. I would like to thank government for providing an amicable environment that allows businesses from which we collect taxes to flourish. Of course, without business, there is no URA, okay? This is evidenced by the collections that uh, we have made over time. Last year, we were able to collect about 12.4% revenue growth up from the previous financial year. We were able to collect about 21.6 trillion shillings, which is the largest revenue collection in the history of Uganda. This financial year, we have a huge task, which the representative of the Minister of Finance has already mentioned, of about 25.6 trillion to collect and are optimistic that this target will be achieved. Of course, when you look at the revenue collected so far for these two months, 
you see that we are in a surplus position, meaning that we are seeing where we are going. URA's mandate is to collect central government taxes, to account for the revenue that we collect, to advise the Ministry of Finance on policy matters, and also educating the taxpaying public. I mentioned the mandate such that you can know where the mandate starts and where it actually stops. This mandate entails streamlining operations, improving the service delivery, and strengthening stakeholder collaboration. Research is pivotal in operations. Actually, in streamlining uh, the area of uh, research, we have a, a new department of information and technology where the research function falls. So we believe in research, and I thank Tuaweza Uganda for undertaking this research, which we believe shall be a benchmark for policy formulation, administrative efficiency, and directing strategy formulation. At the URA, we recognize the importance of research. I already alluded to that. And we pride ourselves in using data in all the operations that we do as the Uganda Revenue Authority. Now, compliance to tax is a behavior, ladies and gentlemen. We segmented our approach in dealing out with our clients who are the taxpayers. Of course, all aimed at ensuring that we nurture that voluntary tax compliance. We have a number of initiatives geared towards inculcating the taxpaying culture. My colleague Mike already mentioned the curriculum that we have at O and A level, which is examinable, the one that we are introducing for the BTVETs. And now our goal is to have taxation mainstreamed at all, is all institutions of learning. Let it be at primary, let it be at tertiary, let it be at university level. Because you need to appreciate uh, why tax is supposed to be paid anyway. We conduct several tax engagements in form of hubs, in form of our Tujenge bus activity, in form of uh, traditional and social media, uh, talk shows, and many ways. That's why you see, by the way, the public, when URA presents itself to them, they find it easy to speak to URA about everything that affects them, if at all they're pointing to government. So for us, we have accepted to present ourselves and stand up to be counted as the authority in ensuring that the taxpaying public is made aware about not only their obligations, but also doing some element of accountability, not only for the taxes we collect, but also for the projects that our government is able to do. We welcome the findings of the research. Of course, when 30 percent citizens say they are unaware about the existence of URA, it speaks a lot to the effort we need to put in educating the masses. It speaks a lot to that because we would be confident that everyone knows that URA collects taxes. But if 30 percent say they do not know the URA exists, it tells a lot. Service delivery is at the core of our mandate. I note that the biggest percentage of respondents in this research received a good service from URA. Of course, when you combine those that said excellent and those that were in the middle, you see that a great percentage say the service from URA has improved. Of course, this is a positive, and we shall do more to ensure that we keep improving our service. And of course, this manifests itself in the various uh, trade facilitation initiatives that we are trying to put up. Uh, if I can talk about the electronic cargo tracking system, if I can talk about the latest being the bonded warehouse information management system, where we want to monitor cargo as it enters the bonded warehouses and to ensure that it is done in a smart way. All these are aimed at ensuring that our service to the taxpayer, who we call our clients. By the new URA, we do not have that word taxpayer. We believe that the taxpayer is our client because if the taxpayer is not there, then the URA has no reason to exist. 
We run several campaigns aimed at promoting uh, customer satisfaction. Of course, let me use this platform to inform you and give accountability to you that every two years we do both an internal client satisfaction survey and an external where we hire an independent firm to do for us a customer satisfaction survey to gauge our level, where are we? Because it is one thing to do all the initiatives, but it's another thing for someone to tell you that what you're doing or how you're serving is actually uh, delivering the result that you want. Um, allow me also to talk about the registration, which is an obligation for every taxpayer. Registration or 18 is actually free. Just like any other service that URA offers. All our services are free because we receive a budget from the Ministry of Finance. Unlike other revenue authorities elsewhere, for us, we, when we collect, we give the ministry and then go and ask the ministry to provide us with the money to collect the taxes. But when they allocate us the money, it means that everything has been funded. So we have no reason of charging the taxpayer. So when the 38% said they were charged for 18, okay? I begin wondering whether they got it from within the URA office or they got it elsewhere. Because you know, in Uganda, uh, people start their businesses. Someone will tell you that we do registration here and of course they will charge you. So this one now, if it speaks a lot to our staff compliance division to pick interest and know these particular clients, where is the tin source? Is it with the URA or it is outside the URA? As an institution, we have zero tolerance to corruption. Zero tolerance to corruption, and I repeat that. And we are venturing into very many initiatives to ensure that URA is corrupt free. You had the latest being the lifestyle audit for our staff. We want to know if you have a lot of money, where did you get it from? Does it tie in with the remuneration that you get? We even have a division, a staff compliance division, which is mandated to see that the staff behave the way URA believes they should behave. And actually, when you look at our core values, we have patriotism, integrity, and professionalism. So if you fall short of that, you have no room in the URA. Whether you believe it or not, that is a fact. And when you got, the story is very different. Of course, we don't come out sometimes to publish how many people have been expelled out of the URA, but there are quite a number who leave the URA daily, weekly, monthly, because of engaging in corrupt activities. The president said the tower is the holy ground and everything we do there must be holy. So we need to live by that. Simplification of our processes, such as uh, introducing the instant team to weed out middlemen is one of the ways through which we are trying to address this corruption. When we say URA operates an open planned office, when we say URA is using systems, we are trying to say that when you use a system, many people can be able to see the system. Unlike when you engage in a transaction between you and the taxpayer. So the instant tin, if at all you do not have a tin, please just go. It is just a two minute, actually one minute process and you get your tin instantly, meaning that we, ha we are weeding out the middlemen out of the whole equation. Now our initiatives such as um, uh, the issuance of, uh, I knew, I knew, actually I need to report to you that with introduction of the instant tin, We've seen our tax register grow. For the last year, we grew by about 800,000 taxpayers because of the instant team. You just need about five fields and then you're there and you get your team. Our initiatives such as uh, the issuance of the receipts and invoices using IFRIS. IFRIS is the electronic fiscal receipting and invoicing solution and using the digital tax stamps. So when you see people begin to to, to query some of these things. It is because they do not want to be accountable. Because with IFRIS, you enter the goods, you issue the invoice and receipt using the system. You have a business to business, okay? We connect our system to your system. 
So people do not want us to mirror into what they do. Yet, we need to be accountable, all of us. If you are making this profit, allow to give government part of that profit to be able to give you the social service. We need more collaboration. My MP has gone, but when she talks about us going to the shops and trying to temporarily close them, it means that probably our people are not being compliant. And as an MP or as a leader, you can take on the lead by inviting URA, move with URA to your constituencies. We are available to educate the clients within the constituencies, such that we avoid all these kind of inconveniences that come. Tax education is a collaborative effort, so is accountability. I employ other agencies in government to join the URA in accounting to the taxpayer. Not for us who face the wrath because it is us who collect. Okay? So someone looks at you and says, you collect. Where do you put my money? You tell them I put it in the consolidated account. So what does it do? So if it is a collaborative effort between all the government agencies to account to the taxpayer for this money collected, we shall see Uganda moving higher. Accountability question is for you and me. It is for you and me. Why? If I may ask, how many of us know what is happening at our parish level or maybe the sub-county level or division level for those who stay in town? How many of you know the projects which government has funded? Because you know, as we collect, part of that money goes back to the different local governments. How many of us have taken the bother to know that these particular activities are supposed to be done this financial year? So how will you demand for accountability when you actually do not know what is happening? Okay. So the accountability question is for me and you to answer. URA, for sure, Uganda, the Uganda we want to see will only be if all of us paid a little. Our tax to GDP ratio currently is about 13%. The lowest in the region. Okay? And research proves, you are all researchers, there's no country that can develop when your tax to GDP ratio is at that level. Out of the 100 people who do things, only 13%. Pay tax. I think it speaks a lot to that. And feedback, to me, is food for champions, just like anyone. So you are welcome the research. We shall employ the findings from this research to improve our operations. Research is made useful only if it is employed. So if we do the research, do not disseminate it, keep it there, it will become obsolete, and we need to make more research. So let us have this research disseminated as widely as possible such that we can use it in our operations. And I think not only URA, many other agencies can pick up this research and use it. The beauty about research is that many aspects are analyzed. You can pick those that are to you, that concern you, and you're able to move to greater heights. Overall, there is goodwill from the masses, of course, this is evidenced by the findings from the research. I was intrigued by that uh, statement that fewer citizens would cheat <laughs> if they had a chance. And I saw the number of the citizens who would cheat was low. It means that there is a will that uh, if we improve everything around us, and if all of us joined us, joined hands together, we would see the Uganda that we want. Ladies and gentlemen, being the last, I should not be, should not speak more than everyone else. I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank our partners, Baweza, Uganda, for undertaking this research. I call upon all the other researchers, please speak interest in tax matters and also undertake several researches around to ensure that we can be in position to collect enough. There are aspects within the URA that disturb us. For example, how to tax e-commerce. You see many people are operating online businesses. How do we tax? How do we venture into the unknown? This can only be done if we have solid research that can guide direction. I say this for, the, for God and my country. 
And with these uh, remarks, ladies and gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to declare this dissemination workshop closed. Thank you. His mind was stuck on her. She had a dress on, but without a bra. On the man, you're a woman in a mongalo weba. Eh, still a baka. And no gawe, any gawe, ye teka. She no come to play, so ya damta. Eh, kugange, ye kawa fata. What you gonna do if she come for your man?